My kids love Play-Doh. Last time, they made a Play-Doh version of their stuffy. It's pretty amazing that we can create arbitrarily complex shapes by squishing, pressing, stretching, rolling, and twisting a simple ball of Play-Doh. This is the core idea of flow-based generating models. In this video, we are going to talk about the main ideas behind normalizing flows, continuous normalizing flows, and a scalable training method called flow matching. We'll leave the techniques for scaling up the training in the next video. Imagine we collect a dataset of images. It would be awesome if we can model the data distribution. We can create new images from this distribution or evaluate the likelihood of a sample. Wasn't that fun, Piglet? But we don't know what the true data distribution is. We only have the samples. On the other hand, we have simple base distributions, like a Gaussian distribution, from which we can easily draw samples and evaluate the likelihood. The idea is to train a generator that transforms a simple distribution into a data distribution. We can train this generator by maximum likelihood. This corresponds to minimizing the KO divergence between the two distributions. So, how do we get a likelihood? Here we have a sample noise Z. We can transform this noise sample Z into an image X. If our generator is invertible, we will know the corresponding noise Z that generates this image. Can we compute a likelihood like this? Well, not quite. Huh? Let's take a look at a one-dimensional example. Here, our base distribution is a uniform distribution between 0 and 1. Suppose our generator is just stretching the z value by a factor of 2. We see that the density of our transform distribution is now half of the original density. This is because the probability contained in these areas must stay the same. The same concept works for any one dimensional density functions. We can compute the likelihood by adding a scalar term to account for how much the density function is stretched or compressed in the local region. We take the absolute value here because either mapping produces the same density. Okay, now let's check the two-dimensional case. We look at a specific location Z plum and its local neighborhood. This factor specifies the change in x1 and x2 directions caused by delta Z1 and this vector specifies the change caused by delta z2. Here we compute the area spanned by the two vectors using determinant. We can now write down the relation that the probabilities in these areas must stay the same. Here is a visual example. Tell me, you look good. Now we can move the delta z to the other side and move them into the determinant. We see that these are just partial derivatives. We transpose this matrix as a warm effector determinant. This matrix has a name, it's the Jacobian matrix. Let's simplify this a bit further. We can move the determinant of the Jacobian matrix to the right hand side and express the reciprocal as the determinant of the inverse transform. This is known as the change of variable formula. Now get back to the maximal likelihood estimation. Using this formula, we can write the local likelihood into two terms. How do we compute this? First, we need an invertible generator G. Second, we need a way to compute the determinant of the Jacobian matrix efficiently. It's hard to create a complex transformation with just one single generator. In practice, we compose a collection of generators to gradually transform a simple base distributions into a complicated data distributions. The likelihood computation of such a model is also simple and involves in multiplying each individual determinant. Here is the local likelihood. Now, let's see some examples of invertible generators in which the determinant of the Jacobian matrix is easy to compute. One popular design is called the coupling layer. The first step is to split the input into two disjoint sets. We do nothing for the first half. We train a neural network to predict the scale and translation vector and compute the second half by element-wise multiplication and addition. These two vectors are then concatenated as the output of the coupling layer. Let's ask the two questions. First, is this generator invertible? Given x, we copy the first half. Then we compute the scaling and translation to invert the second half of z. Here, the neural network can be very complex and does not need to be invertible. Second, can we compute the determinant of the Jacobian matrix efficiently? Here is the Jacobian matrix of a coupling layer. The top left part is an identity matrix 
since we copy the first half of the input directly to the output. The top right part is all zeros, because the output vector has nothing to do with the input here. The bottom left part is tricky. The Jacobian matrix can be very complex, since it involves a neural network. But we don't care. It does not affect the value of the determinant. Finally, the bottom right part is a diagonal matrix because it only has element-wise multiplication and addition. The determinant is just the multiplication of all the predicted scaling values. When we stack these layers together, we need to shuffle these splits around to ensure that all the dimensions are updated. The original paper used a special checkable pattern and a channel masking to create different splits. This type of permutation is later generalized by invertible one-by-one -one convolution. Here, training with one by one convolution achieves a lower negative local likelihood and can generate higher resolution samples. Another example is auto regressive flow. To generate the value of the ice positions, you use the input vectors before the ice positions to compute the condition hi and use it to transform zi to xi using an invertible function tau. Note that this transformer has nothing to do with the transformer we use today in language modeling. We can generate all the outputs following this strategy. If the transformer tau is invertible, we can find the corresponding input z, but this process is sequential. Fortunately, the forward sampling process can be easily parallelized. The Jacobian matrix has a lower triangular structure because it's autoregressive. This means we don't need a full Jacobian to compute a determinant. We just need to compute the gradients on the diagonal and multiply them together. So far, we have seen the coupling blocks and the autoregressive flows. To make the computation trackable, we somehow sacrifice the model's expressiveness. Is it possible to have a free-form Jacobian matrix? Hmm. This is the idea behind the residual flows. The layers in residual flows are very simple. It processes the input Z with the neural network U and add the output u of z back to produce the final output for the layer. First, is this invertible? Given x, can we know what the corresponding z is? In general, this is not feasible. But Stefan said it can be invertible if the function u is a contractive mapping. This means that the distance between the two points after the mapping is smaller than the distance before the mapping. If u is a contractive mapping, then there exists a unique fixed point z star. Let's use x minus u of z as our contractive map. Applying the fixed point theorem, we get this expression. By shuffling the equation a bit, we found that z star is what we want. Since z star is unique, we can revert this residual layer g. The theorem also gives us a bonus and shows us an iterative algorithm to find the unique z star. How about the determinant? With some math, we can expand the determinant into a sum of infinite series of metric traces. But this is scary. We need to compute the trace of Jacobian matrix, perform matrix multiplication up to k's power, and sum up infinite terms. How is it possible? Luckily, we can use some tricks to simplify the computation. To estimate the trace of matrix A, we can pretend there is an identity matrix. We can rewrite the identity matrix as the covariance matrix of a random Gaussian vector V with zero means and univariance. The linearity of expectations allows us to shuffle things around to get this expression. We can now estimate the trace efficiently using Monte Carlo sampling. But then we cannot evaluate the infinite terms. The residual flow paper showcased a trick to compute the unbiased estimate by rewriting the sample finite terms. Next, we will see how we can generalize the residual flow ideas to continuous normalizing flows. Let's take a closer look of the residual flow method. It gradually transforms a simple base distribution into a data distribution via k residual layers. Moving these terms around, we get something that looks like a derivative. When we increase the number of layers k to infinite, we get an ordinary differential equation saying that the change in position of a sample follows the vector field. Our goal is to represent this time-varying vector field with a neural network with parameter theta. This is called a neural ordinary differential equation. Let's visualize what this looks like. Here we see the vector field gradually transform a simple base distribution, like a Gaussian, into a more complicated one. The arrows there specify the time-varying vector fields. 
Here are some 2D examples. Now we understand how vector fields push samples around in space. How does the probability density change at a specific location? Let's use a 1D example to build our some intuitions. Here we plot the probability distributions over x at time t. For a specific position x plum, we have a probability density of pt of x plum. At time t plus epsilon, let's say, the probability density becomes lower at the same position. How can we explain this with our vector field? At this position, the vector field must have pushed the samples away from the position. We can use the spatial gradient of the vector field to quantify the local outgoingness, or in other words, how much it diverges. When the vector field flow into this position, the spatial gradient will be negative. The sum of the change in probability density and the local outgoingness must remain zero. The same relation holds for higher dimensional data, so we can replace the x gradient with a general gradient operator and denote that as a divergence. This is known as the continuity equation, or transport equation. The continuity equation gives us a tool for training continuous normalizing flow using maximal likelihood. Unfortunately, computing the local likelihood involves integrating vector fields over time with an ODE solver. This limits the scalability of training continuous normalizing flows on large datasets or high-resolution images. Next, we will use flow matching to enable scalable training of continuous normalizing flows. Let's look at the continuity equation again. Instead of focusing on learning the right probability density that is computationally expensive, we can instead just learn to match the flow. The time-varying vector field ut fully determines the probability pass and the final target distribution. This insight leads to the flow matching objective. The goal is to train a neural network to match the vector field. Here, the probability pass interpolates from the base distribution at time 0 to the target distribution at time 1. This looks great! The training objective is just a simple L2 regression loss. It's simple to implement and does not involve integrating the vector field during training. But something terrible happened. We don't know what the probability pass or the vector field is. If we know the vector field directly, why do we need this neural network? The trick is creating training data for the probability pass and the vector field using conditioning. Here, we express the marginal probability pass as a mixture of conditional probability pass that vary with some conditioning variable z. Using conditions, we can design a valid conditional probability pass and a vector field for training. Let's say our condition is a single data point in our training dataset. We call it x1. Here is the equation and the visualization of the conditional probability pass. The vector field is also very simple. Intuitively, for any point x, we move toward the data point x1. The speed depends on the time, ensuring that we land exactly on the data point x1 when the time equals 1. We can now define the conditional flow matching objective. The conditional probability, the conditional probability pass, and the conditional vector field are all easy to compute. Surprisingly, the gradients of the conditional flow matching objective are the same as the unconditional one. This provides a scalable ways of training continuous normalizing flows. This is great, let's look at several other designs. Here, instead of conditioning only on the data point x1, we also sample a noise x0 from the base distribution. The conditional probability pass can be a Gaussian distribution with a small variance that moves between x0 and x1. The conditional vector field is constant over time on this pass. This independent coupling conditions leads to methods like rectified flow and stochastic interpolant. We can go beyond simple pair conditioning as well. For example, we can draw multiple samples from the base distribution and multiple data points from the training dataset. We then establish the correspondence between them used through optimal transport and create probability paths and vector fields for training. This helps us create straighter paths for more stable training and faster inference speed. Here is a summary of three examples of conditional flow matching designs. Compared with independent coupling, having some coupling within each mini batch leads to the clear probability pass. Now let's visualize the training process. We independently sample a data point x1, a noise x0 from the base distribution. 
Based on the probability pass, we can create a sample XT. Using this noisy sample, we train a neural network to match the conditional vector field. In this example, the conditional vector field is a constant vector from noise to data. It's useful to put things in perspective by comparing this with diffusion models. In training a diffusion model, we also sample a data point from the dataset, sample noise from a Gaussian distribution with zero means and univariance. We encode the image using a forward diffusion process to get a noisy image. We can then train a neural network to predict the noise. By comparing these two, we can see how flow matching simplifies and generalizes diffusion models. In diffusion models, the conditional probability distributions come from a fixed forward diffusion process. It cannot generate a pure Gaussian noise within a finite number of forward diffusion steps. The flow matching framework focuses directly on moving samples from a base to a target distribution and regress the flow in between. Flow matching keeps the essence of diffusion models but removes the unnecessary restrictions of the forward diffusion process. In summary, we cover the basics of discrete time normalizing flows, continuous normalizing flows, and flow matching as a scalable method for training continuous normalizing flows. I expect that we will see a lot more exciting development and applications of flow matching. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time.